Hello everyone, hello and welcome to the Black Shadow, you're keeping fairly well. So, back on Sunday night, I made my return stream after my trip to North America, uh, playing Dune Imperium on the channel, and what was originally just a hunt to try to find my first actual live game that I've won on stream, turned into victory after victory, and we went on a crazy streak, and over nearly eight hours, just racked up win after win. It was an incredible stream, and thanks to everyone who came along and supported for that. Uh, I have been very curious in the aftermath of trying to work out why exactly that happened. Now, for as much fun as obviously I had on the stream and as much time as we had, you know, being successful, which was a good cathartic feeling considering how badly some of the recent comps had gone, I have been thinking a lot in the aftermath as to why did that actually happen? Uh, you know, it's not often you get runs like that at all, uh, of course, but maybe there's something for me to look back on and learn. So what I want to do is actually go back and look at that whole session in a lot more detail. And I want to use this video as kind of an introduction into that, uh, you know, kind of looking at some of the sort of basic themes and premises that I was using, you know, kind of going into a lot of those games and looking at some of the real key moments that probably got me over the line in a lot of those matches. The hope is, is that by analyzing what I did and what went right, maybe I can learn a little bit of something from it, and maybe you guys might be able to do so too as well. Um, and that's the idea. So I want to use this as a training exercise and a, and a learning experience for the, all of us to try and work out what went right and how you can go on a massive heater too. Now, I don't want to go too far into the weeds on this one. You know, it was, again, nearly eight hours worth of stream. You could be there a long time analyzing all sorts of bits and pieces. So I want to keep it kind of fairly generalized, you know, and also, you know, kind of try to aim this as well to folks that are still, you know, getting used to immortality uh, and getting used to doing Imperium in general. I know there's a lot of folks that are still picking up the game. Uh, I'm still trying to work out how to approach this game, especially at the start where now with immortality, there's so much going on and there's so many things to consider. How is a way to kind of try and get that bit more bite-sized um, and give you kind of a more stable approach of how to introduce yourself into these games and give yourself the best chances possible. So come join me with this video in the next several where we have a little glimpse into one of the craziest streaks of games that I might ever have. So a couple of announcements before we get into the video proper. First of all, uh, CJ is going to be playing in the next Dune After Dark. We streamed live over on the Hidden Assets channel. Uh, this will be at 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 o'clock Pacific. Uh, this has been a pretty proper series so far. You know, a little bit more, little casual sort of play. You know, more about, you know, the folks getting involved and CJ getting a chance to play the community as much as the games themselves. You know, very chill, very relaxed. Um, usually a good time. So I do encourage you to go join him and hang out over there. Also, the second Moadi Melee is going to be played on Saturday, May 13th, of course, being run by Cheeseable. There's still a few spots available for the competition as well, so if you fancy giving yourself a spin at this, do encourage you to go over to the TTS Club Discord and go and sign up over there. There is completely free for you. Uh, straight one-day tournament, uh, free games up towards the into the final match uh, where you can be looking to play. It's a rough time as well for the start times there uh, by EST standards. I will be participating in this as well as intending to stream it live and we'll see how we go. If Sunday stream is anything to go by, maybe I actually have half a chance of doing well at this one as compared to the previous one, which didn't go very well. So let's get into the video proper. So a quick bit of context for what happened on Sunday night. As mentioned, uh, this is the first game I'd played live since my return from North America. And something that I definitely noticed in sort of participating in the previous melee as well as what I've opened is that... Uh, I hadn't played very much Dune Imperium, and, and it had been showing as well. I had not been playing particularly great, and it's just those things. I've had a lot going on, and uh, as CJ, I'm sure, will agree, and to a degree, I'm sure, like Orski and uh, Cheeseball as well, to an extent as well. When you're involved in content creation, as well as sort of management of tournaments and organizing stuff, bits and pieces, you do sometimes struggle just to find the time just to play the game you're involved in. Uh, and the ring rust 100% showed, um, and I had been struggling. So I'd been going into the streets and the LFGs, you know, kind of getting that ring rust in, getting the reps in, and that led us to Sunday stream, where I still hadn't won a match on stream. Really, really annoyed me, but I was determined to finally chalk one up. Of course, one turned into two, which by the end of it turned into four and a pretty decently grafted out second place in the fifth game as well. Uh, it was an unreal stream um, and I couldn't believe how well it went for me. And I like to think that 
I was more successful, not just out of pure luck, but actually, you know, making good decisions um, and bringing sort of like decent openings in. That's what I really felt from this stream, sort of looking back at it before we go into real detail, is I felt like I gave myself sort of the best possible chance to win these games at the start of them. I do think the start of Immortality is incredibly important as well. Uh, why you do see, you know, sometimes like these real late game surges, they generally come from having given yourself a good setup in the beginning and just giving yourself chances and options. So what I want to do is do some videos where we look into the game specifically and kind of analyze it more in depth. But I want to use this one to talk more about just generally opening the game. And that's going to be most of the focus of this and kind of what I think are things that you should consider and look to do. So one of the things that was very unusual about this entire stream was that in all five matches that I played, I end up in the third position in every single game, which is crazy really the odds of that happening are minuscule um but i can't say that it was necessarily bad for me uh third position is definitely viewed as sort of one of the better spots onto the table um for a variety of reasons so to better explain the immediate benefits of sitting in position three, as well as kind of talking a little bit about where all the seat positions are at the moment, I brought this mock board so we can sort of better visualize how the game currently stands. So we use the hidden pick system. Uh, so out of the 14 leaders, uh, we remove eight, six of them to leave eight remaining, and then we pick in reverse. So player four, player three, player two, player one, who is currently the first player here. So a lot of the thoughts about what players opening news should be has definitely changed a little bit over the course of time. However, it all mainly revolves around player two. And the reason it revolves around player two is that player two is the first person on the game, basically, who can put their agent down in the same place twice. Uh, and that is a pretty significant advantage. And this was mainly because of the Rise of X, and in particular, Interstellar shipping, which requires two influence and able to be accessing. So what we ended up was getting in a situation in sort of general games was that player one would do whatever. And what player two wants to do is player two wants to get to fold space right here. And the idea being that they want to get there in the first round to get a, a one bump with their spacing. And then in the second round, go and take the second bump, get their way to the, uh, the second influence. And then use that to get their way to instead of shipping. It is an incredibly powerful space. Uh, we talk about actual compression on this game uh, a bit in times. And being able to get so much shipping done and get cash on these resources is huge. To get further faction bumps. Get troops, you know, obviously going into the uh, combat. So you can start changing for those. And also getting hold of resources, particularly Solari. So you can look to get hold of your sword master as quickly as humanely possible. So this inevitably put player one in a bit of an awkward spot where he was forced to try to stop player two gaining what was a pretty significant early advantage. So what would happen is player one would almost inevitably, if they get any faction access, is they would be forced to go to the fold space um, themselves. Now, this is not out of any likelihood that we're going to be able to hit it twice because, of course, in the next round, they go forth. So any other player could hit this and stop him from getting access to that shipping. What it does is it stops green from getting access to it as well and so denying it to the ship from everyone basically as long as possible um, and this proved fairly effective you know it helped to blunt an advantage that player two definitely had there were ways around this uh, the baron for example his martial ability could just instead decide that he is going to go to uh, hardy warriors and the idea being that if it was a combat with a, a signet bump or an influence bump uh, tessie could also do this as well is they could just go here hit this get a load of troops in and then use the passive bump they gain either from the master oak ability um or from tezia's signet being combine that with the wild bump from the combat and use that to get uh, so they don't even have to worry about this anyways and they can instead just go straight into stellar shipping that way but the meta, as it always does, shifts a little bit. And folks have realized that there are two good things to have at the start of the game. Either your actions doing a lot of things at once or simply having more actions. And so what ended up happening is that every time that player one decides they're going to go to fold space, well, Green was like, well, hold on a second. Yeah, you can do that, and that makes sense and all. But uh, you see, uh, instead of shipping is great, but Ryzex also introduced this smuggling space here, and players realized that, again, because player two is the first person to hit the space twice, what they can do is player two can now just start going to smuggling. And what they would do is they'd go there twice, and the idea being that they'd have five plus one 
plus one, and then combine that with some sort of leader ability, would get hold of eight Solari, so that then they hit this twice, make their way to Swordmaster round two, and so they're just simply taking more action than anyone else and getting more use out of that cards, especially in Immortality, now that you've got the experimentation to have the research symbols, so they can also make a push onto this as well and get hold of some of these nice rewards here towards the back of the track a lot sooner than other players, and obviously making a push for the two spice up here as well. So unless there's some Solari in the opening conflict, there's only a few leaders that can actually pull this trick off. And just to make a mention of them, uh, Count Ilbarn is an obvious one. He has his Signet Ring ability, which just literally gets him an extra Solari just for using it, which gets him across to the 8 threshold so he can do the Swordmaster. Luke Lido's alternative is the complete opposite, where space in the council just simply costs one in the first place. So 7 Solari is all he actually even needs. A uh, few others can be noted as well. Uh, the Beast starts off an extra Solari in the first place. Uh, a laser can actually generate Solari using his 1-step ahead ability. If you kind of time it right and get the right cards to do that which is not guaranteed uh, but is worth noting uh, and interesting enough as well Yuna is also an option for this because she just simply generates more slurry every single time so she can actually go um, just smuggle once and then hit wealth twice and that gets her to eight slurry at three plus three plus two it's a kind of an unusual way to get there but I have seen that done before so this idea of a Swordmaster Rush is not a new idea by any stretch of the imagination. It's been in existence since day one, and ironically, it's been kind of easier to do in the past, but also more expensive. And the reason for that is because of the old Cell Milan space, where just simply getting hold of free spice, you can trade that up here for eight Solari, and just get your sword master immediately, and you could crack on with that. Now, there was a slight issue with that, and that it was, again, a bit pricey to do, because there was less ways to generate spice in the first days, and so you were basically forced to have to get your spice via the mining spot. In particular, you'd probably have to go, say, steel suits first, go to Great Flat here, get your free spice, use that to sell melange here, and then use the 8 Solari there to get your Swordmaster. But the downside to this strategy was because you're having to go mining, it means that you're costing yourself your water. So by the time you get your Swordmaster, you have absolutely nothing in the tank, and you have no options whatsoever. Because smuggling now exists, you don't actually have to do that anymore. Now at this point, I'm sure you're going, hold on a second, Shadow. Didn't you just say that you were in position free for all these matches? So why don't you're talking about players one and two? What's that got to do with you? Well, it informs quite a lot. You see, because we're in this situation in the Rise of X in Immortality, where you are basically got player one and player two are in this sort of little dance situation now, where uh, player one has to decide either they're going to go to fold space here so that they can deny instead of shipping, or they've got to decide they're going to go to smuggling um, so that they can can deny player two getting access to Swordmaster early, what ended up happening is that green will just simply do whatever the red player doesn't do. So if um, player one does decide they're going to go to fold space, they're like, okay, we'll just go smuggle instead and use that to get our Swordmaster and then vice versa. So because these two are kind of interlocked here in this situation, player three has this interesting spot where they kind of have a bit of freedom in how to approach the game. They're kind of the first players that have an opportunity to kind of decide how the game is going to start to get directed. And player three has quite a lot of nice little choices ahead of them, depending on what sort of strategy you're going to go for. Just to give a brief summary of some of the things Player 3 can do, we'll talk about a couple of these in a bit more detail in a moment. So Player 3's got several options. So a common one is for them to go to Steel Suits. The idea being that getting hold of this second water here is really nice, and it gives you, at least for a while, exclusive control of the Great Flat spot, and it's the older situation of hostaging the Great Flat, as it became known. Uh, the idea being that you kind of get yourself exclusive access to this spot, and no one else can get there, and you let the spice build up, you cash it out when it's convenient for you, getting some extra spice on the side, and you can use that, you know, either to go uh, buying some techs over here. Maybe you want to use that for conspiring so you can get out of some Solari so you can use that to get to Swordmaster yourself. Maybe even it builds up so much you pick up some combat that you find your way to an early Highliner perhaps as well. Put some pressure on sort of turn two, turn three when everyone spent some resources fighting for like some early resources. You then cash in sort of round two, round three, round four. You put that pressure on, kind of wards people away from it and you can really profit from that as well. Another option you could explore, and you do see a lot with sort of card draw leaders, is that they will instead open up with a visit to wealth. And the idea to wealth is not necessarily to help them boost them towards getting Swordmaster, although it can double as that as a backup plan. But mainly the idea is to go wealth and then Mentat. And what you're then doing 
is that you're basically stalling, which is going to be good for the turn you're in because you're obviously going to be able to kind of get last dibs on the combat and kind of just see how much strength you need so you can be a lot more accurate in your allocation of resources. But also the card is really good because that means that not only are you going to have, a, in theory, a better reveal to get hold of some decent Imperium Road cards, but it also gives the extra curiosity of that. It means that your second round, you're already cycling your deck. And so there are, are definitely possibilities that you can end up getting one of these Imperium Road cards into and second round which is really really good of course there's other options for you as well if you so see if it's combat you're interested in you can definitely hit hardy warriors yourself looking to take it down if it's like a victory point doesn't seem too bad uh you could also look to maybe make your own way to tech negotiation to get a better reveal uh maybe uh, make your stab towards a couple of techs that might be of interest to you there's a whole variety of ideas for you uh even hitting sort of like imperial base on a hagger basin are also not outrageous spots maybe you want to go carfag early you want to pick up an intrigue maybe you want to go arakeen with say like paul atreides with his ring draw a couple of cards and kind of do the same sort of idea you're doing in wealth you know there's a lot of diversity to play a free and a lot of options that you you can look to explore um and i think that's one of the real advantages player three that they're not locked into this position where player one and two kind of feel themselves at the moment i think there's one other thing as well for player three that i think is often missed but i will bring up is that player three also has the ability to threaten everything that player two does if the first two players decide that they're not going to play in this kind of interlock way. So a good example of this, for example, would be, let's say player one is 100 more time, wants to do a load of shipping. So he makes his way over to full space, as you would expect, you know, pretty street, reasonable opening move. But player two is Baron Harkonnen. And obviously he wants to get shipping as well ahead of Hundro. And let's say that it's a conflict which gives some um, influence, as we mentioned before. So player two decides that he's going to make his way over to Hardy Warriors uh, so that he can then look to do that challenge and get, um, you know, win the combat and get his access to instead of shipping that way seems pretty reasonable well now as the player free position you're what you're effectively happening is now you have the ability to make your way to smuggling twice but of course what's going to happen in the next round well player two's never going to go um you know he's never going smuggling in the next round he is inevitably going to have got hold of his uh his bump um you know to for instead of shipping whether he needs it or not even you know and if he does he still can just go to fold space next round round two so he can get his instead of shipping and that just allows you to go fold space twice as Lido here uh, do that twice and get to Swordmaster first off round two you're pretty happy with that but you see this also works in reverse as well if player one is the one who decides that they're going to do something a little bit curious so let's say player one maybe decides you know that they go I don't know say like tech negotiation they want to get hold of artillery instantly or maybe they figure that they can't let the Baron get off their master stroke so they decide to go to Hardy Warriors to put troops in their way well then what kind of effectively happens you get this weird situation where this first player marker almost might as well be over here and then what you end up happening is that player two and player four Three are now kind of in this interlock situation where player two has to decide which one of these two they want, whether they want to go to fold space or if they want to go to smuggling. And then player three simply goes to whichever one they don't do. And, you know, neither of you two are going to block each other almost ever realistically. So if Baron decides he wants shipping, well, then you go to fold space. Um, you know, you go to smuggling even so you can get hold of your sword master. And if Baron decides that he's going to, you know, or different leader, for example, decides he's going to go to Smugness and get hold of his Swordmaster, then you can at least go to Fold Space twice here, and then at least you and Player 1 in theory are both battling over the Interstellar shipping spot, which is not maybe ideal. You're not getting unique access to it, but 2 out of 4, especially early on, is still pretty decent. So a quick mention on Player 4, although it's not the focus video, I want to just make a quick mention for it. Player 4 definitely is not in the best of situations at the moment because unfortunately being this far back means that although you have sort of the knowledge of the leaders, you have the least choice of where spaces you're going to go. Um, and as Player 4, you can pretty much expect that you're never going to get to fold space and you're never going to get to smuggling because typically one of those get taken ahead of you. And then Player 3 has you know a variety of options ahead of you and you kind of have to take whatever's left. So although Player 3 or is you kind of in a similar boat as player three and you can sort of play those two positions a little bit sort of similar in that way you've got to bear in mind that uh yellow is going to have first cracks here or whatever you've got to have so as player four you've got to definitely be a little bit more willing to think on your feet um and have a couple of plans at the back of your mind of how you're going to approach it because if you just go in single-minded in the first round you're going to really struggle
So it's definitely an advantage, I think, of being in the third position is that there is this great deal of flexibility that is allowed to you. Uh, and player four can have that as a bit as well, even though obviously getting access to shipping or Swordmaster early uh, is really good. And player four can't realistically count on that unless they find their way to maybe get hold of Spice, Conspire, pick up some Slurry somewhere and kind of make everything work out, which can happen. And you can definitely jump the queue there, but you can't expect that necessarily. So I just want to touch upon a couple of these openers in a little bit more detail. Not too much, though. Uh, the first one we're talking about is going to Research Station first round. And it's not totally uncommon now in Immortality to see a player will decide that they're going to go ahead to Steel Suits in order to pick up the extra water here. And then decide that in their second move, they're going to make their way over to Research Station to draw a couple of cards and also to get some early research going. Now, there's a couple of reasons that the players might decide to do this. Obviously, it is going to potentially give them a really healthy reveal onto their first hand which means they're going to be able to target some pretty high-value cards potentially in the row, and it also means that they're going to be potentially seeing some of these in the second turn, which, as I mentioned before, is always pretty good. But a main reason that you see this right now is because of the Talaxa row, and in particular, and in my belief, is because of these free Costa cards, the free specimen cards, that this is pretty much the only way that you can actually get hold of them. There are a couple of other minor ways, um, but it's not relevant for this video. So the reason I bring up these cards, and it's a bit of a theme you might be picking up over the course of a lot of these opening moves, is try and secure exclusive access to something first before anyone else, um, is because going by the research station is to be the first way that you can look to get hold of free specimen cubes. The idea being that you take one trip up on here, you then go ahead and reveal both your experimentation cubes here for two more, and then you can use that to buy one of these particular cards, and no one else can do that, so you get first crack of it. Uh, just looking at these very quickly, um, there are are kind of two different classes of these and there's a simple one I'm talking about so there are some cards here that are very effective but tend to require just a little bit of time to get going so for example Guiling is a great example uh, being able to get double uh, bumps out of faction vids is awesome can you do a lot of crazy stuff the problem is is that you still have to buy these faction accesses in the first place so you can trash them so you can't use that immediately a natural reflex of course requires a bit of work on the research track you're not going to get that done straight away and Gola while it is very powerful don't get me Wrong, it still needs some really powerful agent abilities in order to make full use out of here. You know, so if, say for example, Steel Suit Manufacturing Gola is devastating if used correctly, but if you just only got like Bene Gesserit this year, double card draw with that is not doing a whole lot for you, and it still takes time and a little bit of luck to work, admittedly. So what we're focusing on is Scientific Breakthrough, which is definitely a good all-rounder card, and that point in the end is great, but in particular what we're talking about is Stitched Horror and Pyta Genius Advisor. These are two absolutely S-class cards, and both are incredibly devastating at the very start of the game if you can get them straight away. Pyta, of course, losing troops, you're going to have a few at the start to double draw, and basically at research stations on the side, can hypercharge your deck, make you make a real push across the research early, and make you incredibly dangerous, pick up some really, really powerful cards so you can surge in the late game. And then you got Stitched Horror, which is a devastating graph card, and it's just, it is the epitome of action compression. Being able to, you know, use this to get hold of Talaxu bumps, so you're getting at least this point, if not that one as well. Uh, the card trashing's good. Uh, using Stitch Horror and just sending this to Research Station just to keep going here again and again, and to keep drawing Stitch Horror again and again, very, very devastating. Now, it should be noted, you should exercise this plan with a little bit of caution and not go for it particularly. One of the reasons we're able to do this as Hundro is because we had both experimentation cards in hand. So, of course, if you're targeting these, for example, because it's expensive, you're losing all your resources and potentially putting in all your troops. So, if you decide that you're going to go for it and, let's say, the Baron here decides to do exactly the same move, but he's only got one experimentation, well, what are you going to do if you decide to do that and then, well... You don't pull your experimentation and you don't pull any reveal. You've suddenly burnt all your resources and uh, you've got a problem. So do exercise this with a bit of discretion and a bit of care. If you don't have both, you are ultimately punting. And if your punt doesn't work, you know, you better have a backup plan. But I do think the Talaxia Row is a very important consideration at the start of the game uh, because of Immortality and the fact that now Atomics goes, that at any point in the game, a player could decide, 
I don't know, look at the Imperium row and just rip it out and get something else brand new. And what this ends up happening is that where in Rise of X, you can base a lot of your choices on the Imperium row and looking to kind of pinch certain cards, there's no guarantee of anything. It's just simply not stable. So basing your choices purely on that alone is just not sustainable. The Imperium row doesn't ever move. And potentially there's some cards up here that can stay for a long time. If you get a card sort of like Usurp, for example, or Twisted Mentat, uh, you know, obviously both of these are really good and they're very expensive and take a while but you've got again got to be a little bit careful with these cards you can try to target them research station but you're still not guaranteed to get these first once you get these four specimen costs um because you are gonna have to draw your deck a second time and everyone else will draw it a second time and so like if say if you're in third or in fourth position specifically um it's very possible that players might just reveal ahead of you and pinch them and then you've got a problem. Same thing as well should be noted if like these two cost of cards as well. Some of these are very effective, don't get me wrong. But the problem is, again, being in third or fourth position is that, well, players one and two are just going to reveal before you. Unless you're going to reveal early in player three position, which almost never feels that great. Um, so you can't rely on picking up these cards all that often. The only thing I think you should also consider when you're making open choices is have a look at the tech row as well. Because again, they can't be changed willy-nilly. Um, and I kind of class it into sort of three different types of technology. So the first one we'll look at is sort of like the insta-get, you know, early hitters uh, that will automatically give you something that you can use um, and can really help you give you, again, more options and just kind of try and give you that edge at the early start of the game. Artillery is a great example because it's the only tech that costs one persuade, uh, one spice, I should say. So any player on the table can just decide that they're just going to go ahead and make the way to tech negotiations as any leader, take artillery, and that can obviously give them a much more dangerous combat deck in the later game. It also can be pretty good rounds three and four if they pull those daggers and get a funky draw. They can just put in a couple of troops into the combat and suddenly their power is looking really good and they're going to pin some victory points here and there. Pretty solid. But of course, it's not just those techs as well. And uh, the two costers I bring up as well um, for a variety of reasons. Again, these are all solid. Wind traps, giving you extra wool on the spot means that you can target Great Flat. You can target Research Station and put pressure on anyone that's gone steel suits uh, that, that kind of forces their hand to go earlier than they would like. Minimic, obviously a great option as well. Uh, that one persuasion is with you for the rest of the game. And of course, if you decide that you're going to go ahead and send a dagger... Uh, over to tech negotiation for that uh, you know to get this sort of like early that that reveal that round you're getting plus two on it that's gonna be good for cards you know like these you know maybe you can find a way to quiz us how sooner than you have any right to you know you can get those pinches very effective other couple of options as well memo core is an obvious one as well uh, getting the extra bump is really good for a lot of characters especially the beast who of course the beast is really effective at getting hold of loads of these 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 two cost techs and put a lot of pressure on people early because he starts at that spice. So, you know, taking him in position three or position four, you can target these techs immediately. And people don't want you getting wind traps. Don't want you getting definitely don't want you getting memo quarters so that you can look to boost up your brutality ability here. Get your faction ring going and just put even more pressure on the card. People do not want you to do that as well. I'll make a special mention for Sonic Stupers as well, which does obviously is pretty cheap, but you the idea of this is to to get a load of intrigues and then sink away the ones you don't need for ones to try and find ones that you do and you're not going to be doing this at the very start of the game uh, the extra intrigue at the beginning is useful don't get me wrong and can be some real fun wild cards but it's not quite as consistent as these four right here Next up, we're going to talk about those techs that you're not necessarily going to get straight away, but are kind of those mid-game heavy hitters. Although if you can get them a little bit early, that's great as well. Um, and these tend to be very economy focused in kind of keeping your engine going and accelerating it in the mid-game. And the funny thing is, is there's quite a few of these and they all do it in completely different ways. I think it's absolutely fascinating. So an obvious one to say is like Shuttle Fleet. Uh, getting hold of those two bumps is great. allows you to obviously charge alliances, ship, that sort of thing. But you get the plus two Solar at the start of every round, which is great for certain leaders allows you, you know to dominate menta uh it can easily fund you to high council without you having to worry about finding the money somewhere uh maybe some cheeky sword master steals you know by just going to wealth or conspire um although if you're going to shuttle fleet and conspire that is a lot of spice you found somewhere so i don't know how you quite you'd manage that but you get the idea and yet um on the side there are other techs that do sort of similar things hot projectors is a really good tech it's probably my favorite tech in the game really fun um because what it allows you to do is although you 
you're just discarding a card to draw another card. It doesn't seem a lot on paper. What it's allowing you to do is just have so much more efficiency with your actions. And it makes you much less susceptible to bad draws. Where you draw that dagger at the wrong time. And like, oh, that's really annoying. And you're trying to hunt for a decent card. Well, you can just get rid of it now. And you can just get a better card. And the great thing is as well, is not only are you doing that. You're also just simply drawing more cards per round and having bigger hands, which means you're going to see those better cards more often. And so you're improving the economy of your hand and your agent actions. And also maybe picking up a spice or two, by the way, uh, which would be pretty nice. Uh, another style of economy tech is training drones, for example. Um, also, invasion ships is a similar idea as well, where you're just getting sheer firepower on the ground. Like, getting this round two, for example, if the game goes, you know, round seven, round eight, that's basically a highliner plus... Uh, without having to spend the spice to get it as well over the course of the game and you're just being able to get hold of those extra troops and you're just putting extra pressure into the combat so that you can obviously look to target um, victory points but these kind of more resource heavy combats as well uh, where you get just more sort of tangible things um, are pretty useful cloak and dagger is a great example raid stockpile is one you can really put a lot of pressure on um, and basically get that spice back on the house and then you can reallocate that to other things very effective now, there's quite a few of these, and obviously only certain ones are going to give you uh, different benefits, depending on the sort of the style of game you're looking to play, you know, whether you're going kind of very faction heavy, or you're going to do a lot of card drawing, and obviously you want to tweak these as you go, um, but these are the style ones that you can kind of look at, and the great thing is, again, being in, say, position 3, and also position 4 to some effect as well, is because player uh, 2 is almost never getting text early, because he's so busy with either shipping or getting his sword master, and Hundro's kind of having to exert pressure to kind of block one of those more often than not it means that as player three or four you can look to target these spy spaces uh pick up some of the um the spice here and then use that to get your text early and try to convert that into advantage for your game so definitely things worth considering and then we kind of get to the more slightly niche, not necessarily bad, but any stretch of imagination text. Like some of these are obviously very, very powerful. Spy satellites, you could perhaps go and put this into the second pile as well. I was kind of iffy and biffs on this. It kind of works both ways. It depends what you think the game is going to go. And it also depends a lot on your opponent's work. If you think someone is setting themselves up to pick up spy satellites, then maybe you want to get in front and take that. But obviously that's going to have a big effect on how you're going to approach the rest of the game. Uh, but again, none of these are necessarily bad. I mean, flagships, eight spies is a point. Great. I mean, you can't hate victory points. They're pretty good here. Detonation device, obviously, going very combat heavy. Very effective for some other leaders as well. But some are going to be a bit more dependent on how the game goes. Shoot transports, you're almost never going to buy um, just hard going to tech negotiation. You'll usually pick it up while you're shipping, unless you're going for, like, say, machine culture and end game victory points. Machine ordnance is a similar situation as well. You know, the four swords in each combat is really good. But getting the spice to buy this and the slurry to go high counts without compromising your game otherwise is difficult. Um, and it generally since I think this tends to be a, a tech that tends to be if you're doing well It helps you do even better, but it's not necessarily a good tech to try and catch up from just my own opinion And then space what I may mention as well. It's not the best of tech sadly in the game It's probably a bit expensive uh, But people will buy it at the end for the card draw But if you can get this early and if you can make it being able to put any card you acquire on top of your deck Can be really devastating because that's you acquire in any means so that's any cards you buy from from the row that's any cards you acquire like with ekaz's ring that's fold spaces you get from going here and then also interesting immortality also counts the talaxu deck as well you can you can overwrite the requirement here of the research and do it via this way as well very rare not a lot of players go for that but if you can find a way to make that work and get these cards into your hand immediately that's pretty scary and the other thing you just got to keep an eye on when you're also picking leaders is that there are certain leaders that will clash more with other types of leaders because they're after the same kind of thing. And so you just got to be a bit wary, especially I think nowadays, that if you're choosing from a leader in sort of like these opposition, position four, position three, you've got to put a bit of thought into what you think the person to your right is going to buy and what leader he's going to take for the game. Because if it's someone that is going to oppose you for a lot of spots that you're after, that's going to suck and that is going to cause a lot of damage now an obvious candidate for that is say leaders that want to go to mentat a lot here 
Um, so obviously that's going to be your leaders sort of like Ilbard, Leto, Paul Atreides, Ekaz early in the game as well. We'll kind of want to get there too. Uh, because they all got, get various benefits from going to the Mentat uh, for one reason or another. But another interesting type of leaders that I've noticed as well is leaders that actually want to uh, get hold and go to Spice Spaces more often. Um, which uh, Hundred definitely falls into, especially at the very start of the game, a very common opening for Hundred will be that he'll use like a faction access or smuggling to do whatever he wants. And then what he'll like to do is then second action, go to preferably Imperial Basin. The idea being that he can get hold of his, his uh, spice, which powers his signet ring, which is very important for Hundro. It's a big part of his game plan, um, but still save the water. But, of course, it's difficult for Hunter to do that if, say, Leto's on his right. Because, of course, Leto also wants to do that because of prudent diplomacy. And so he wants to go to the same space as well so that he can start chasing the factions. Bit of problem for them if, say, Ariana's also in the game. Because, of course, she wants to go spy spaces because whenever she harvests, she draws cards. So if you've got all these leaders that are in the same game uh, and they end up all getting picked, they're all going to get in each other's way and that is going to cause some damage. So to tie everything we've talked about in this video, uh, let's go to a couple of the games that I played and look just at me choosing leaders and look at the kind of leaders that I chose and why I chose them. And sort of, again, just kind of thought process that I think are really beneficial at the start of the game uh, being in these sort of positions. So let's take the very first game here. Um, and this was what we got when we zoom in here. So have a look at our situation. So first things first, let's go at the three things that we talked about. First of all, we got the Talaxu row. So we've got Usurp and we got Face Dancer. Usurp's a good card, don't get me wrong wrong it can be really fun and really powerful sometimes but it is a again it's a four coster i can't guarantee i'm gonna get it and face dancer is definitely a good card but it's very possible i'll never see it um it's very easy for um player one or player two to reveal two experimentations and sometimes fourth player will reveal early as well to pinch it so player three hard to get that so we're not gonna worry about that too much that kind of rules out going research station but on this other side, we've got our texting again. You see all these mid-game punches here. You know, Shuttle Fleet, Holtzman Engine can also do that as well. Uh, Shuttle Fleet especially is a really big target early. The sooner you can get that and get that money in, uh, that is great and can definitely help those Mentat-dependent leaders to get absolute maximum out of their ability. So if we go and take that information and look at our pool of leaders, we can now start making a much more informed decision. So interestingly, all these leaders don't hugely interact with each other and aren't really getting each other's way. But there are a couple of things that we've noted. Definitely, there's a bit of combat focus here with Tezia, who I imagine if I don't get picked, is almost certainly getting picked in second position. Makes logical sense. Uh, but Rombo is definitely someone who might end up getting picked like in first position, just trying to get out in front. Uh, Yuna as well could be dangerous too. Um, but as I was mentioning with Shuttle Fleet, if we can look to target early and get hold of that, who makes really good use of Mentat? Well, Paul Atreides definitely can benefit from a lot. Here's the thing is that while he doesn't get anything specifically more tangible for Mentat, i.e. not getting it cheap or just drawing more cards, the benefit of Paul is that he knows what he's drawing into. And that lets him ride uh, a line a lot more because he knows what he's going to pick up. You can plan your moves a lot better. Uh, and that can definitely be really useful in the back end of the game where you can play on the edge a lot more um, you know, fiercely when you're trying to buy Spassus Flows. Whereas other players have got to play a little bit safe sometimes because they don't know what they're going to draw. Paul knows. And so you can be a lot more insane decisive with your moves and can be really really good and so if we look at the leaders that actually did get chosen you can see beast pick in fourth position which i actually low-key beast is actually not bad there at all because again his extra resources just gives him that extra versatility and also you know he can challenge these techs and look to go shuttle fleet as well if i don't go for it as well so i've kind of got in front of that tez you in second position pretty obvious choice and helena in first which i don't think is her best spot uh but maybe looking to get hold of her signet ring to try to pinch uh steel suits manufacturer which is a pretty good card in helena's hand is very scary Gary. So next up, we'll have a look at game twos. And Josh, I'm not going to go through all these, just some examples. So let's look at this one again as well in third position. So kind of a similar situation with the Talaxi row. Usurp turned up again. Saw a lot of Usurp, actually. Uh, can't really target. Talaxi Betray is a great card, but it gets two costa. It's not impossible someone's going to try and reveal early for that because it is very, very powerful. Um, but again, you know, look at the, the text. It's Shuffle turned up again, which is really, really cool. Is again, an obvious target to go for here. Uh, Detonation is a bit kind of, unless I really am going all in with combat, which is is a bit tricky and sonic snoopers is an option there as well and you know something to have as a backup you know if i go for shuttle fleet but someone pinches it sonic snoopers can definitely be a pretty versatile backup 
So we again look to combine that information with what's presented for leader-wise. Uh, a very combative set of leaders here as well. Uh, Beast, Baron, Tezia, Romba. Um, so there could be a lot of action. But you have this interesting thing where Tezia and Baron also kind of oppose each other. Um, and this comes again from Rise of X. Whereas Baron uh, wants to basically just charge two alliances and get the game over as quickly as possible. Tezia's strength is looking to then chase those alliances later on with those extra bumps and just be a real hassle. Uh, and is a real fawn and Baron side. So I think it was not impossible if I don't pick um, either of these that they could well both get picked in this game. Seems fairly reasonable. Um, so I went with Beast for this one. Again, his extra resource means that I can just... I can just threaten everything in player three. If I get on some early spice, I threaten ev I threaten so many things. I can threaten shuttle fleet. I can threaten uh, conspire for swordmaster. I can sh threaten an early highliner. I can threaten so many different things, and you've got to do that. I think I've, you know is that is one of your options is your flexibility. So you've got to assert. Give yourself options and just make the table have to try to react to your game because they can only stop so much and not many people are going to try to do so, um, but it is going to affect them and you're always going to be able to make decent decisions which set you up better in the long run. And we'll have a look at the fourth game I played. Last one, just but again, going through this process, you know, kind of getting into sort of this idea of you know, things to consider at the start of the game. Uh, so, Pyogenius Advisor is on the top of the Talaxia row. Very, very strong card and is good for any card draw, as we mentioned. Very, very powerful. And you could definitely consider going Steel Suit Tree Station 4. You've got to be a bit careful. Do need the troops in order to fund him. But if you can supply those, then you've got a lot of fun times going. And while I've not really talked about the Imperium row much, uh, you know, I, you, something you have to consider at least a little bit. Uh, Pilot Juice Viat with all those uh, card draws. Well, there's some pretty good cards around here that are expensive that we can target, which no one else can. And Chandra should have been there. It's going to be pretty scary for people here as well. If we look at our text as well, a uh, lot of, again, decent options here as well. You know, uh, Pyder and Holtzman looks like an obvious pair together and really strong. But even if we don't want to do that, we can go more combat heavy uh, with artillery, uh, which can give us some flexibility. And again, Wind Traps is also there as well as an option for like a beast, for example. Um, again, just giving yourself options and just giving yourself the best chance here. And if we go to the leader selection here, uh, this is actually a really tricky one. I considered playing Paul Trades again, um, but I did want to play someone different on stream because Paul just has so many different options you here. You can go artillery and look to go uh, really heavy on combat for the mid game. The artillery pool idea that I mentioned in the uh, meme or meta uh, podcast, that's that idea. But then I go with Armory Kaz again. But if I can get Piter straight away, like that is so good for Ekaz. It benefits his coordination ability in so many ways. Really, really strong. Uh, we can also occasionally get his conscription going off with his Signet Ring to pinch shifting leeches right away, which obviously is itself a really scary card. Um, and we can just threaten so many players with so many things. It makes us really really difficult to play against. Other options that wouldn't have been outrageous, a laser also would have been good, and Ariane I think also would have been totally fine here as well. Um, but I'm not particularly experienced with those leaders, um, you know, and there's there's a core set that I'm sort of much more experienced with. I don't play ECAS that much, to be honest. It's pretty rare for me, uh, but this seemed like an ECAS game, and so that's why we went with that. That's going to do it probably for this video. Again, I don't think there's anything hugely revelatory uh, for you to play this game. Absolute tons. But you know, if you're still kind of getting used to immortality uh, and trying to figure out where you want to start from, because there is so many options uh, at the beginning of this game um, you know, to consider. And it can be a bit overwhelming. Totally get that. I hope there's a bit of food for thought here of why you might want to take particular directions. And again, there are other options to what I've talked about as well. It's far from exclusive. There are plenty of other alternatives available to you. Uh, but hopefully, you know, you can kind of look at that, um, you know, what I've presented here and kind of, you know, use it as a, as a basis to try and give yourself a better chance at the start of your games. So very much for listening. Uh, if you've got any thoughts, uh, comments, obviously I'll respond to those as we can. Um, and if you've got any uh, particular things that you want me to talk about um, when I get to looking at some of the games we played actually on stream and certain decisions I made, then please let me know as well. Um, and I'll make sure to cover those in a bit of extra detail. Um, hopefully this has been useful to you. And, uh, you know, to be fair, talking about this myself I and mean, just reviewing and analyzing what I'm doing and why, I'd say it's been useful to me too. And that's a good thing. So take care of yourselves, everyone. Have ourselves uh, a lovely day. And we'll see you pretty soon.